want to thank you, Judy. And, uh, I want to thank you, Judy and Stephen uh, and the Mirrorwood Center. And I especially want to thank those of you who are attending. I think we'll have a lot of stimulation today. Um, the night show, the Dark Horse Trilogy book, Judy. Um, the three, yeah, the three novels. Um, yeah, the, um, the Dark Horse Trilogy of novels. Uh, this is regarded Independence Day. Um, is is about America's second birth. It takes place from 1859 to 1865. Book one takes place during the antebellum South. It's, the second book takes place in Civil War in Missouri. You'll find that interesting. And the third book takes place during Reconstruction back in Mississippi. Especially the third book is very relevant today because supposedly uh, the slaves had been freed at that time. Uh, as throughout history, um, freedom and democracy were at risk and never so much as in this period. Um, I, I, with each book, I'm going to relate some historical facts, just a few that will really open your eyes, that open my eyes for each period. Then I'll do a reading from the novel. And then at the end of the three books, we'll have a, a discussion period. You can make your comments or ask any questions. There'll be plenty to talk about by the time we get there. In all three novels, blacks and whites, men and women, are all are trying to survive in a caste, racist, class, sexist society. Um, as you know, uh, when the United States was established, not everyone was free. Blacks were still enslaved and women's rights were very limited. Um, in all three novels, uh, so all th the, the main characters uh, have to use subterfuge and trickery to fulfill their aspirations, which leads to very meaningful juxtapositions and, and, and co connections. To get my themes across, I use many literary devices, irony, humor, drama, tragedy. Um, book one, The Lies That Bind, Judy, show that one, um, takes place uh, no, the, just The Lies That Bind, yeah, uh, takes place during 1859 to 1861. It, it starts during slavery and ends right at the beginning of the Civil War. There were two critical facts about that period that, that will explain quite a bit to you. Uh, first of all, the South, what do you think the South's greatest assets were? Greatest assets were land, and the second greatest asset was slaves. So you can see why the uh, plantation owners didn't want to free their slaves. They'd be losing their second greatest asset. The other critical point, which is really to the point in my novels, the average slave was sold five times in their life. Now imagine that, so, sometimes sold away to other states. Um, Imagine what that did to families and communities, to individuals. Remember, in most areas, slaves were proscribed from education. So uh, show the slave sales, Judy, um, where the first book takes place is in Mississippi. And uh, OK, we, we can bring it down, you know, if you want. Um, Mississippi is one of the richest states in the country, and that's because of the plantation system. In my novel, The Lies at Pine, in a small Mississippi hamlet, Turkle, a fugitive trickster named Dirksen Hurst, or Dirk Hurst, he forms a secret partnership with a group of escaped slaves, but it's an egalitarian partnership. 
they so everyone is equal. Um, the one thing about this group is to survive and fool the town, Dirk pretends to be the white master and his partners pretend to be his slaves. Well, uh, as you can see, the, the whole situation is loaded with uncertainty, um, danger, risk, irony. Being the egalitarian ideas are important, but being human beings, even with their ideals, even with the pressure of society against them and so forth, they run into real problems just getting along, being human. So there's a, a uh, also I um, want to mention the novel contains many mysterious women characters who are concealing secrets just as deadly as the men. And in this novel, I tried to make the men and the women um, stories roughly equal. And of course they converge. And when, when this, uh, it was considered for film, the, the one who liked it the best was actually Sherry Lansing, a um, female producer. Um, now, because I switched the roles, well, I should mention, Dirk is, is a, a main character. He's the hustler and he's uh, the front man for the group, but he has big ideas. And unfortunately he has something to prove. So he leads the group in, into all kinds of problems. They have all kinds of trouble. Um, Big Josh is actually the real leader of the group. He has a lot of wisdom and knowledge. Big Josh is a, was a slave. He ran their master's plantation. And historically, there were slaves that ran the plantations for their masters. Uh, the third main character of, of the partnership, the Dark Horse partnership, was Isaac. Isaac was a maroon, and uh, uh, if you don't know the term, uh, there were a number of slaves, probably thousands, that escaped their masters and went to live in the wild because being a slave was too harsh. Isaac is a maroon, and he completely distrusts white people, especially Dirk, his partner, because he, know, he knows Dirk's a hustler and he doesn't trust white people. So actually in the triangle of the three, Big Josh usually has to make peace between the group. Okay, as you can see, because I switched the roles around, the real functional boss is not the white man and so forth. Um, I, I switched their roles to, from the stereotypical roles to their functional roles. This I did to debunk all the Southern myths and lies about the period, uh, especially I was inspired to debunk a great novel that I love, Absalom, Absalom by Faulkner, but also it, it, it plays off of Gone with the Wind, which is false and so forth. Um, now in the beginning, the men distrust each other, but as the novel goes along, they have to learn to to trust each other and get along in, the, in their roles. Okay, uh, I'm going to, uh, I skipped that one visual, if you could show that a section, uh, to show the runaway slave, Judy, just a moment. Um, I'm gonna read from chapter one of The Lies That Bind. Yeah, it's just a, this is a bill, uh, uh, a notice for a ward for a runaway slave. Okay, we can remove that, Judy. Um, in this in this scene, which is in the first chapter, uh, Dirk has has been running away. He's a, uh, he's hiding from the consequences. One of his deals gone wrong, and he runs and he runs into the slaves who were also hiding in the swamp. And, uh, <clears throat> but Isaac was having none of it. Now, this is angry Isaac. Ain't no law, D Dirk has already said he's gonna write, sign a manumission paper to make them free. And Isaac says, ain't no law, your paper in Mississippi gonna make us free. Who's gonna sign it? You, by the way, my uh, impressionistic dialogue works very well in, in writing. Who's gonna sign it? You, but what? 
What if you all become partners with me, working alongside me? The plantation will be ours, all of ours, Hurst said loudly, dropping the other boot. Do you understand? Partners. He could see the big man's mind working. We'll split the money even, share everything. What's hard on you will be hard on me. That was the deal he'd always offered, the old Chickasaw way. Not that some white partners hadn't robbed him blind in the past, even after shaking his hand. Now, if you're waiting for a better offer than that, he said emphatically, I wish you luck. Man could talk a rabbit into a trap, bone skinny Isaac said disdainfully. But our plantation will belong to all of us, Isaac, Hurst countered, offering his hand. Partner, partner, ha, huh, Isaac spit. Even if you ain't lying, which I know you is, you think all the white folks in town gonna throw us a Sunday church opal, so social? Let's make a pilot welcome our new black plantation owners, he mocked. We got to get us north, Josh. We got to get somewhere, Big Josh said. From Mississippi, Hurst said, how? Big Josh placed his hands on his hips. This tormented, Dirk could see that this tormented uh, vigil on Indian land offered no solution to their suspended and vulnerable state. And venturing back to the white world, was a bed of vipers, especially considering their master's fate. When your best hopes amount to either starving in the woods or risking a rope, it seemed hard times would only get worse. On the other hand, he, he, he knew they feared he would be leading them into a trap. If we goes back, we just more run off slaves, Tall Long Lou said. Maybe they think we killed General Toe-headed Bammer suggested. We got to bury him in the swamp where we'll be wearing hemp around our neck, Isaac said, squeezing his own for effect. Isaac, Hurst looked Isaac over. This man is more like me than any of the others, he thought, not believing in anyone or anything, as torn legs from the world as I am. And then I, I will skip a little bit towards the end, but Hurst knew the uncertainty inherent in their dilemma. Further delay could spoil the deal, could even lead to tragedy. He needed to force their decision now. Fearing a fatal blow, he pushed his way through the wall of men surrounding him toward the Rhone, his ears attuned to every clank and rattle of their tools. Y'all just stay here, he announced, at least until Wounded Wolf finds some white men who will trade horses without papers for slaves without papers. I'm sure they'll be kindly folks looking to serve you with a bow and scrape. As he reached his horse, he heard a babble of whispers behind him. Wait, Big Josh called after him. Hurst stopped in his tracks, a smile spreading. Now I ain't promised nothing yet, Big Josh continued. But if we go, if we go, suppose we pretend to be your slaves when folks come around. We could do that. At least we'd be someplace besides here. That would work, sure, Dirk exclaimed, leading the road back to the group. We could keep our deal a secret and you'd have your manumission papers to fall back on, even though I signed them. He felt like he was playing for his life and the first two cards dealt to him were kings. <clears throat> then Big Josh fixed them eye to eye. They catch on to us. We be in jail trouble, probably gets a whipping. But you being the white man, You'd be in hanging trouble. So uh, now, I, uh, and I will say throughout the trilogy, the number one female character is Antoinette. That's Dirk's love interest. She's a mysterious fugitive from New Orleans. Okay, uh, here is the cover of Honor Among Us, Cast, the second book. And don't know why there's a cannon there. There's not a cannon in the book, but yeah, yeah. it worked. People get the idea. Okay, uh, we can get rid of that. Yeah, thanks. The, uh, in Honor Among Outcasts, it takes place in 1863. The protagonists, our partners and Antoinette, flee north to Missouri to escape from slavery and the con legal consequences of some of their action. 
and where they would wind up entangled in the dirtiest, bloodiest guerrilla war in U.S. history. I don't know if you all knew that about Missouri, but it was nasty stuff. Uh, the book title suggests even outcasts can act with honor and even powerful interests acting in their own interests can be dishonorable. So the, here's the basic plot of Honor Among Outcasts. <clears throat> the Dirk Dirkhurst partners form a colored regiment in Missouri with Dirk as a required white officer, like he played the master in the lies that bind. Dirk and Antoinette being two Southerners are accused of being spies for the South to protect a corrupt and incompetent general, Union general, his reputation. Uh, they're caught in a system which is supposed to be benevolent, but it looks like they're in big danger. Thus, Big Josh, Isaac, and their black partners must risk their lives to save the couple from the hangman. All right. Uh, Let's let, uh, show the Lawrence Masker just a little bit, uh, Judy. Yeah, um, I talked about it being the, the nastiest war in, in American history. Okay, that, that's good for that, Judy, thanks. Um, the, um, in Missouri, which if, if you see the situation, um, there, Missouri's 115,000 slaves were mostly along the Missouri River, which cut the state in half. Uh, from, and the counties from Callaway to Jackson were called very appropriately Little Dixie. And uh, the cash crops were hemp and tobacco. Those were shipped down the Missouri River to St. Louis from there, they were loaded onto steamboats and shipped to New Orleans and the warehouses there from where, and then they were shipped all over the world. So it was quite a profitable venture. In Little Dixie, the pro-union forces, pro-union farmers were a minority and suffered bloody ravages at, at the hands of their pro-Confederate neighbors. Union troops as well, Scavenging supplies could be very predatory and, and equally as deadly. Uh, I mentioned the war was deadly. It was so deadly that the refugees were pouring into St. Louis, which was the Union headquarters for the state. And But while in transit, these poor people were preyed upon by Confederate and Union troops too. Um, St. Louis is in the novel. Uh, I have a place like, for example, the Myrtle Street Prison, um, which was used by the Union to hold Confederate prisoners. Well, actually, the Myrtle Street Prison was a converted slaveholding pen, nicknamed the Hotel de Lynch by after its owner. So, um, now I mentioned that the war was deadly on both sides. Uh, both sides took scalps. There, there was murder. Bloody Bill Anderson, a Confederate leader, um, wore ears of many killed on a strap around his neck. I mean, uh, so it, it got so bad, especially around Western Missouri, that the Union Army took all the, the guerrilla leaders' women their wives, their sisters, and so forth, their mothers, and, and imprisoned them in a house in Kansas City. Well, the house collapsed, and many of the women were killed in Maine. So in re retribution, Quantrill, you've all probably heard of Quantrill's Raiders, inv with 400 men, invaded Lawrence, Kansas, burned down the town, which killed all 200 of the male residents because they were abolitionists, and um, it, it was just a massacre. Well, the Union Army, that was too much. The Union Army was fed up. So um, the Army, the Union issued General Order Number 11, and the four counties in Western Missouri where the guerrillas lived 
where they got food and intelligence and so forth. The Union Army burned out all four counties, all the property, all the homes, all the fields, all the woods. So there'd be no place for the guerrillas to hide. And uh, they kicked out everyone, pro-Union, pro-Confederate. These counties became known as the Burnt District. Now, Missouri was an odd situation, politically, legally. My allergies are acting up a little bit today. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation freed slaves in the states that were in rebellion. However, Missouri was under martial law and not in rebellion. So the slaves in Missouri, which the Union controlled, were not free. Fortunately, Lincoln permitted black soldiers into the Union Army and those who were enlisted were free then and forever. I guess you could show the two enlisted pictures a moment. Uh, Judy, okay, yeah. And in the war, about 100,000 black soldiers served the Union and they were one of the big differences in the war. You can show the other one just briefly too, the Grand Army of Black Men is a good book. Okay, well, uh, now, um, the, um, at the time the novel starts, Dirk and his partners are uh, contraband laborers. If you wonder about the term contraband, contraband, as you may know, is uh, stolen property, right? Or illegal property. Of course, the uh, Confederate army was being supported by slave labor in the Confederate territories. And also slave labor built their fortifications and so forth. So Lincoln said, well, if, there's, if, this is pro if this property, slaves, is supporting the Confederacy, let's take it and use it ourselves." And actually the Union paid for the, for the labor of slaves who escaped to the Union lines. Thus, the, the scene I'm gonna read from uh, is where they're notified, where Dirk notifies them that they're going to get into the Union Army, which will be, um, which will make them free men. Of course, there's the irony built into this situation every which way. Okay. Uh, draws, jaws dropped as Dirk entered the circle, sporting a crisp new Missouri State Militia Captain's uniform. Men, Dirk crowed proudly, were in the army, in the MSM. There were cries of jubilation and relieved laughter. The men leaped up, hugged, and backslapped each other. It took some moments for Big Josh to quiet everyone down. We're going to form our own regiment, the 9th. Us and all the freedmen volunteers and the contrabands too, you all be free. I'm naming it the Dark Horse Regiment like we called our plantation back in Turkle. Gentlemen, Dark Horse lives again. Josh just shook his head in admiration and partial disbelief. Right after work, their friend had disappeared as he was wont to do, seeking some advantage for them. Sometimes he returned with nothing. Sometimes he, he came back with an unexpected boot but he couldn't see any pitfall in this situation. Even better, Dirk added, pausing for effect. The MSM will be a cavalry unit. Cavalry will be riding, not walking. But Dirk just stuttered, what do you mean? The generals say he won't allow no colored soldiers, soldiers in his district. Oh, to hell with General Sparks. He's federal army, Dirk replied haughtily. Fellas, we're in the Missouri state militia. As of tomorrow morning, Dark Horse is the MSM's ninth calorie. Now the MSM don't have the equipment the Federal Army has. The horses are broke down and the weapons are ancient, but we can make do, can't we? Just think, men. Tomorrow morning you'll be putting on new uniforms from the quartermaster. I already filled out the paperwork. Yes, but the general say, Josh interrupted, recognize, recognizing that familiar twinkle in Dirk's eyes. He examined Dirk's face. You hiding something, Dirk? 
What's the catch? Well, it's not a cash, it's a bonus. See, Josh, we're registered. We're registered as a white regiment. Only way I could do it on the on, in this district, right? The men groaned as bewildered and distraught expressions supplanted the earlier joy in their voices. Listen, Dirk said, the army pays $13, right? But it only pays colored troops seven. That's right, so? This is your craziest idea, Josh said. What are we gonna do, paint ourselves white? Of course not, but listen, friend, Josh said. We ain't getting tar tangled in none of your tricks. All we do suffer to finally get in the army and you think we're gonna risk it for $6? Dirk, we proud to be colored troops fighting for President Lincoln. And that's a fact, that's who we are. Let's just get all the slaves free and then we just take our chances on getting that $6. Besides that, I hear the colored soldiers in the East went on strike for that equal pay. Did you know they hung the black sergeant leading the protest? You heard that? No, Dirk said contrary, I haven't. You want us the chance getting hung for $6? Of course, that's just one of the legal situations they run into in this book. Okay, well, uh, briefly, Judy, uh, hold up the uh, book three, Lies It Behind. Excuse me, Something in Madness. This is the newest book in the series, Something in Madness. And it takes place in uh, 1865, right, right after the Civil War, during a period begun, which you've been, probably been hearing about, a lot about lately, um, uh, Reconstruction. But it's not quite the way it's portrayed in uh, the media. After the war, we can put that down. Uh, after the war, uh, thanks, Judy. After the war, uh, the laws were changed. S slaves were technically free. The people's hearts weren't changed in the South. And all the elements of today's racial tension, plus Jim Crow, segregation, were formed here. The basic plot of it is, after Appomattox, Dirk and his two surviving black friends, Big Josh and Long Lou, returned to Mississippi, accompanied by Antoinette and a boy named Calum, who's uh, Big Josh and Long Lou saved from Union troops in, in, in the North, in Missouri. What they find is typical in the South. Ex-Confederates and powerful planters still in charge of the town, who fear emancipation is turning their old world topsy-turvy. These ruthless interests are leveraging cruel black codes, terror, and even deadly force to reverse emancipation, to establish de facto slavery under a legalistic guide. And the more you research it, the more you'll find out that's true. Faulkner wrote, the past is not dead. It's not even past. Is, is the Civil War really over? These days, you, you wonder sometimes. Here is an additional historical context. <clears throat> uh, the Constitutional Convention in Mississippi was dominated by Confederate governors, senators, and generals. So do you think they were gonna put freedmen, the interests of freedmen, black people, in, in, at the head of their situation. In the novel, the freedmen led by Big Josh lead a petition drive to Jackson to present that and uh, to, to plead for a reconciliation between the races. One of the reviewers locally uh, said, oh, this is impossible. Well, actually it's based on something that really happened and uh, in South Carolina. So, most important, I guess show black, uh, the, the next visual for a second, uh, Judy. <clears throat> yeah, Southern reactions. And the KKK is not in this story, but it, that was just the beginning of, of that type of movement. Uh, <clears throat> the black code, we can get rid of that. Uh, Judy, yeah, thanks. Uh, the South instituted what they call black codes. 
and these were restrictive laws enforced throughout the South. In 1865, they became state law in Mississippi and South Carolina under their new uh, pro-union pro constitutions, supposedly. Um, and uh, under the black laws, freedmen were required to be on annual contracts to a plantation. So they kept their labor supply, and but they were paid once a year. Now, if blacks tried to, freedmen tried to leave uh, the plantation where they were working, if, if, if they are for any type of violation, they could you forfeit their whole year's pay. Now, I, I don't know how much better than slavery that is. Uh, there were vagrancy clause in the back codes, and this was uh, important in the book as well. Freedmen who were off the plantations without written permission could be arrested as vagrants. And um, now I'd mentioned earlier uh, that slaves were sold five times in their life. When they became free, many freedmen were out on the roads trying to unite with their families, trying to find their families. So that meant they were subject to being arrested and uh, fined, and if they couldn't pay the fines, which being freedmen, they didn't, couldn't, their labor was sold and they were sold away as, as, as actual slave labor by another name. And you might show that picture, Judy, of the, the black coat picture. Um, and you can see here's, a, here's a, a work gang. These are people that were just on the road and were arrested. Um, Long Lou, Dirk's partner, gets caught up in this scheme and is put into horrible conditions. A lot of these people were worked to death. There was no reason to keep them alive. Uh, they didn't get good food. They didn't get me medical uh, treatment. <clears throat> also, you can bring that down, Judy, thanks. Penal codes. Uh, were kept the same. They just exchanged the word slave for the word freeman. There were separate laws and, and courts for blacks and whites. Blacks could not rent land. So if they owned land, they had to get permission. And blacks could not own a gun to protect themselves. And many were killed on suspicion. So in, in the lies that, in something in madness, uh, I've introduced a new character, and his name is uh, Colonel Rutherford. And he is the unregenerate old plantation owner. And he is against, he was against getting rid of slavery. He's a Confederate. So um, it, it, in this scene, uh, Dirk and An Antoinette and Big Josh and their friends, they're all staying at an old plantation that's been deserted and is being worked by the slaves that had hung around and not run off with the Union troops. So um, one night, Colonel Rutherford leads a group of uh, night riders out and they're surrounding a stable where they keep their supplies and, the, and their grain and their animals. But gathering what little courage he had, Dirk walked directly towards Rutherford What's this all about, Colonel Dirk demanded. Well, if it ain't the traitor, Rutherford remarked and spit in the dirt. Traitor to his country and his eyes searching the area. Traitor to his race. I'm not a traitor to anything, Dirk countered, holding his head high. If you want me to respect your service in the war, then you need to respect mine. Quickly surveyed the men. He noted that seven pistols were aimed at him. This land doesn't belong to you, he said to Rutherford. You and these men have no right to be here. Show me your papers, sir. Well, here's all the papers I need, Mr. Hearst, indicating the pistols. Just then, six men emerged from the stable, waving aloft books with worn and missing covers. They rushed up to Rutherford. Books, all kinds of men there, one cried. Rutherford glared angrily at dirt. Burn it. Burn it down, he ordered. A shot went out, and others carrying torches dismounted to join the six. 
Wait, Dirk shouted, backing toward the stable door. This is illegal. Where's Bake, the sheriff? The men with the torches paused, looking to Rutherford. This stable's been harboring Negro miners. That's in violation of the codes, as, as well as, as the education. What do you mean, harboring miners, Dirk demanded? This is a school. It's in the apprenticeship clause. Read it yourself. Any Negro under the age of 18 shall be apprenticed to his former master. We're going to roust out and round up the ones we can identify and get them where they belong. Rutherford faced the men with torches. Go on now, set that building on fire. Dirk was frantic. They're about to uh, raise the stable where the community held school and stored grain and more horrifying, tear the children from the arms of their parents. Wait, you can't do this. Go on, gut it, Rutherford ordered. Hear me? So, um, um, anyway, uh, I was thinking, I think I'm gonna do another little scene in this newest book, just recently out. And I'd mentioned that uh, Long Lou gets caught up in, in, in a scheme. He's arrested on vagrancy charges. E even that, he had papers, but they were destroyed. And because of mistreatment, when Dirk finally is able to liberate him from C Colonel Rutherford's plantation, he's, uh, to save his life, they have to cut off the bottom of uh, one of Longley's legs. So Dirk contacts the Union Army, which he manages to persuade it to show up. And they're having a hearing uh, about the, this situation, <clears throat> about Long Lou's imp imprisonment and the imprisonment of all the people who are arrested on the vagrancy clause. Okay, Wayne, Wayne Dunham, the Colonel's lawyer, sprang to his feet. General, here in Turkle, a Negro cannot testify against a white man. That's the law. I'll remind you that this is a hearing, the general said, that this hearing is being held under the authority of the United States Congress, Mr. Dunham. The Freedmen's Bureau is represented by Mr. Douglas Anderson, and I represent the U.S. Army. We will indeed hear Mr. Jones's testimony. Rutherford slammed his fist on the table. Putting a nigger on equal footing with a white man violates God's law and natural law, he shouted. Those laws are laws Washington cannot repeal. In that case, Colonel, the general said, I suggest your lawyer file a formal appeal with God. I'm sure he'll be sympathetic with your predicament. As for our purposes, we will gather all the pertinent facts. Now, Mr. Jones, I am most interested in your claim of a mass pit for Colonel Rutherford's labors. How did you come to know about this? The day they take me to the colonel's place, the overseer put me on what they call burial duty. Another man on the duty, Joe Patton, told me they always put the new men on burial, kind of as a warning. So as they told us to carry out a Negro fuel hand who die and bury his body at the edge of the woods, no coffin or nothing. Turns out we didn't have to dig much cause they was other Negroes buried in that hole. And Joe tells me there is more than one of them pits. This is hearsay, General Lawyer Dunham objected. Hearsay, hearsay from a nigger, Rutherford shouted. It's a nigger's word against a white man. Hearsay, yes, the general replied. Let's hear what this man has to say. Continue, Mr. Jones. Yes, sir. So as we start to dig, but the pit weren't too well covered. Mostly it was loose dirt. Pretty soon my shovel hits a body, and as they keep on digging, there's other bodies and skulls and bones. All dead niggers, Joe say to me, killed by hunger and disease. And that's what I saw, General. This man is lying, Dunham ejected. No such thing exists on Rutherford Plantation. You can't believe a crazy nigger, Rutherford shouted. He's just telling a story that Hearst made up. It's a total fabrication, a fiction. We'll see about that, the general said. He turned to his aide. Have Corporal Bernie take a company out to Rutherford's. If these graves do exist, have the freedmen exhume the, exhume the evidence and have Bernie take the overseers into custody as witnesses. 
then bring all of Rutherford's freedmen to our camp for their safety. Tell Bernie to get the report to me tonight. So, well, that is the issue. And the issue is, is freedom still at risk these days? Is freedom still on trial? Are people in the country free yet? Um, are voting rights tightening? Are, are we becoming more democratic? Is the influence of money in politics any less than when the planners controlled uh, the legislatures? Uh, are women's rights jeopardized? Um, are there any, by the way, uh, I wanna mention, you can, you can go into my website on edpratzel.com, like pretzel with an O, edpratzel.com, or you can just order the books on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or from your local bookstore. If they're out of stock, they'll order them for you, I'm sure. So uh, anyway, uh, Judy, you wanna throw up uh, the floor for any questions or comments? Yeah, Ed, there's a question that was came through on the chat box. Um, what were the charges in the black coat arrests? Oh, okay. Um, there were a number of things in, in something in madness in my book, something in madness, the charge against Long Lou, Long Lou, uh, he was one of the people who had been, you know, I mentioned that slaves were sold away, sold five times in their lifetime. And Long Lou had been sold away from his wife and children years before, before the war. So Long Lou was wanted to wasn't going to stay in Mississippi. He was going to go to the East Coast to meet his children. Well, he's he was arrested on a vagrancy charge. And of course, with separate white courts and black courts, uh, uh, he was pronounced, he was, the verdict was he was guilty of being a, uh, a vagrant. Although he had papers, those were destroyed because ruffians were paid to, by the number of freedmen they could get arrested because they wanted to supply labor. So uh, in that case, uh, uh, Long Lou was arrested on a vagrancy charge and he, his fine was paid off by him working as basically a slave labor. Other charges, uh, if you're familiar with the term miscegenation, there was a miscegenation clause. Um, miscegenation means a mixing of, of, of races in, in a sexual way, uh, our, our marriage. Uh, actually, you'll find this very surprising. surprising. They were so worried about miscegenation in the South that um, there, there, was, you could, there was a potential death penalty for, for a, a mixed couple. So, uh, um, that was, that was basically, the, and there were a lot of other clauses. Um, I don't wanna go through the whole law now, but they, 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 they wanted to keep freedmen in their place. And, and these laws did it for a long time. In 1876, when the Union Army uh, went away, then we got Jim Crow, we got segregation. It was never easy. Actually, after the war was over, uh, it was a common belief in the South. There were two common beliefs. One, even among people that were pro-Union in the South, they believed that the North won the war in the army, in the field, but the South had won the war because everybody was, the heart was the same and they were tougher than before the war. And, and they also saw that slavery was not gonna go away and, and white superiority was not going, going to go away. Um, I know these are rough subjects, but uh, th this is the way it is. And this is where we come from as a country. And uh, when I first wrote the first book and the first script, uh, uh, Eliza Bine and sent it to Hollywood, it was, it was quite earth shattering and it, it got a lot of hot interest. So uh, uh, probably at, if, it, if I sent it back out there at this time, it, it, it would fit the mainstream, but it was, it was quite different. 
There's another question um, from Stanley. What type of research was required to develop the dialects used in your characters? Oh, uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, very interesting. The, the dialect, um, and that's an interesting story. Mostly that is from reading Southern literature. And, uh, and, I say, and as I said, uh, the, my, my dialogue is not exact dialogue, it's impressionistic dialogue. And I did that because, um, well, uh, I, I didn't want to make it seem too stereotypical on the dialogue, but I wanted to give the impression of, I've got a lot of uh, great reviews on the dialogue. Um, so that's basically where it came from. Actually, a funny story, when I finished the second book, Honor Among Outcasts, I sent it to my agent and uh, she went and she changed all the dial, all the dialogue to be like step and fetch it. If you uh, know that reference, step and fetch it was, was a stereotypical um, black person in the South during the twenties and thirties. So, uh, uh, so I had to go change all the dialect back <laughs> in the whole book. And, uh, but that's basically where it is. And, uh, you know, I, I got it from um, maybe basically literature from sounding it out in my head. I, any other questions? At this point, not in the chat. Does anyone else have any other questions about these books, about the process? I don't know. I don't see any more questions. Do okay. you want to well, mention? I was going to ask you if you wanted to mention your other book too. Yeah, um, yeah, I could do that. I don't have a picture of it. Um, well. <laughs> my other book is. Uh, uh, I can hold it up. <clears throat> the Antiquities Dealer. Uh, it's a David Greenberg mystery novel, it kind of takes place in modern times. And uh, it's more first person, it's not historical novel. And uh, I, I wrote this after I wrote the second novel because I wanted to write something different, something contemporary. The book's a lot of fun. The uh, suspects, uh, there are a Jewish radical, a, a, a Muslim radical, and a Christian radical. So, uh, and poor David Greenberg, being an antiquities dealer, he gets called into uh, finding the, the last nail of the crucifixion. And for an, uh, an Israeli society, he's brought in by a former girlfriend. And they... Um, um, this Israeli society wants to clone the great minds of Europe, and they're going to start with Jesus Christ. But uh, they're, they're, like all my stories, there's a lot of, especially in this one, there's a lot of humor in it, a lot of irony in it. it takes place in mostly in St. Louis, but also in Israel. And uh, some characters based on people I knew. There's two gamblers who are losers in St. Louis. There's a... Um, um, a um, uh, televangelist name whose name is Hubris Nation, and uh, um, and uh, there's a lot of surprises in there and twists and turns. Uh, while we do have a minute, I've got uh, I've mentioned the women in 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 the lives at Vine, and maybe I ought to read a scene with with a woman in it. Sure. Okay. Because women are really important, but you know, I, I have limited time here. In uh, this book, one of the main characters in the Lies That Bind, which I'll hold up again. Um, one of the main characters is um, Mrs. French, who uh, is concealing secrets at least as deadly as the men are. And she is the most powerful person in town, the richest person in town. She's also a recluse and everybody in town hates her, but she knows how to use power. She's very manipulative. 
And she's her offspring's name is Devereaux, Devereaux French. So read you this little scene. Mother, it's dug. The grave is dug, Devereaux French gasped, his throat tightening. Devereaux abruptly entered his mother's great master suite on the second floor of the mansion, wearing his finest black satin suit. His slim, pale figure advanced up the irregular pathway formed between his mother's priceless relics, his boots clicking against the hardwood floor. Although Devereaux was 31, the rosy softness of his naked cheeks and his slight stature gave one the sense of an adolescent boy, not a mature man. Lightly freckled and frail with cropped auburn hair, this morning he appeared a trembling, emaciated stick figure with eyes bloodshot and swollen. Devereaux's important in the story too. Uh, then go down and stick him in the ground, his mother, Mrs. Marie Bressard French demanded, clearly not about to bud from where she sat at the ornate chessboard that dominated her room. You're not attending your grandson's burial, Devereaux exclaimed. He stared at his mother, waiting for a response, but Mrs. French obstinately clenched her jaw. Her eyes scanned her elaborate chessboard in jerks and start, refusing to look up. Are you spotting God a pawn like you sacrificed me? Devereaux cried sardonically. Again, he was ignored. You'd go down to sign papers for the bank, but not to attend my child's funeral? He dabbed his eyes with a handkerchief. Mrs. French exhaled and slumped in her chair, crating her forehead in her palm. Reluctantly, she fixed her eyes on him. Do you think I have the slightest intention of going down where those fools could gawk at me? Me, the village villain? A shaft of light opened from the door across her, revealing a colorful child-sized chair positioned beside her. A local furniture maker to adorn the tiny seat with brightly painted bluebirds, grapes, and wildflowers. Now it's sat empty. And send someone to remove this chair, Mrs. French added. I've had enough of these damn bluebirds. So that's Mrs. French. And uh, so I'm going to, um, and I'm going to show everybody the pictures of the books one more time, just a okay. quick um, okay. picture. So they, you know, look familiar. And I believe that um, one of the participants also mentioned the books, I believe might be on Hoopla. So I'm um, mm. not quite familiar with that venue but um shulamit you want to say you want to unmute yourself no. yeah no offense to you ed for all your hard work and labor um i have 60 boxes of books so i'm not buying another book <laughs> and, good for you um, when the J opens up the dispensary, I'll be putting some back. Um, so Hoopla is just a thing that you can put on your phone and they have eBooks and they have books on, you know, like CDs or something. Anyway, so that, that's how I read. And I oh, went- Well, all my books are available on electronic books. Good, because I went, I went looking and, and they had just the one uh, honor among outcasts so I just reserved it and downloaded it but they didn't oh, have the other yeah, they're all available electronic books and this book is also uh, the publisher uh, it's also on um, ebooks voice yeah voice it's it, besides e -book. audio book yeah audio it's book. also an audio book which is done by a man in in Hollywood and uh, he did a really nice job on it. I'm looking forward to reading what, what I can find. So thank you for presenting today. Uh, yeah, I, I think you'd enjoy the antiquities dealer if you like thriller type thing. It's a lot of irony because the main character is Jewish, but he's kind of a secular Jew. And, and uh, the Israeli society is, is very traditionalist Jewish. And then there's a, there's a, 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 a Christians, uh, one of the suspects is uh, a former football player who was a member of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff in the book. So there's two right. Texas oil millionaires who uh, are involved with the Reverend. So, well, and it's kind yeah, of fun little reference back to St. Louis, too. So that, that would be kind of interesting to see yeah. and read yeah. in your book. That would be kind of fun, too. So thank you so much. Anyone else have another 
Larry, uh, do you have a question? Does anyone else have any questions? I, I think that might be it for today. Well, Ed, thank you so much. Well, it was very interesting. It. And the books sound very interesting. All of your books actually sound yeah. very interesting. And we really appreciate you giving us a review and some reading today. It was really pleasurable. And um, we really thank you. Thank you for Mirowitz and everyone that participated. Thank you, Judy. Appreciate, appreciate you all coming. So I appreciate it. Take care, Ed. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.